So welcome to everyone who is joining us for this session of the SDSN Youth Investment Readiness Program. Today, we're very lucky to have Manu and Roxandra here, two experts who support the Babele platform that the course and the, uh, the program is running on. And they're going to talk today about financial modeling. So over to you. Hi, Lauren. Thank you very much. We are thrilled to do this webinar uh, for you. We are the two co-founders of the Babele platform. We have been doing uh, workshops on business modeling uh, for social entrepreneurs in 16 different countries with over 600 entrepreneurs trained. And um, yeah, we are thrilled to share our experience and we are going to go through examples of Babele as well in this uh, webinar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have one. Um, so uh, we really like the financial modeling uh, workshop because that's one of the most fundamental aspects of uh, being a social entrepreneur. Because uh, if you are a social entrepreneur, so you've got to be more than just a visionary. Uh, you cannot just be the product guy, you need to be also a business person at the same time. And uh, being a business person, it means that you also need to pay attention to finance. Um, and that's what's actually going to make a difference if you, for example, meet impact investors and uh, ultimately change your life for the better. And um, so you need to understand the underlying financial flows of your business. And that's key to your understanding of how to manage your social enterprise. And um, yeah, like there is, a, I believe, a misconception, which is sometimes entrepreneurs, they think that they can leave the whole financial uh, aspects and the numbers to the bookkeepers and the accountants. And uh, that cannot be more wrong because uh, you certainly want to have a bookkeeper and accountant, but you also need to be able to analyze the, the financial data and you need to be able to understand all the underlying financial flows of your business because that's ultimately how it's going to allow you to manage your business. So this is why in this webinar we are going to explain you uh, what financial forecasting is about and how to do it, uh, but also explain you these uh, main financial statements, the balance sheet, cash flow statement, and income statement in order to better understand your bookkeeper, no? And so uh, first thing first, uh, financial forecasting. Uh, what is it? It's a fancy word, but it means actually forecasting your revenues and your costs. And in the previous webinar, webinar seven on revenue modeling uh, with Richard Liebrecht, you have done a forecasting of your revenue streams. So what we are going to do now in depth is um, forecasting the costs. My uh, the presentation got blocked. <laughs> so, sorry. Yeah. And so forecasting your costs, and then we are going to see an example uh, of uh, financial forecasting um, that we are going to do with our own example on Babele. Uh, so for assessing your uh, costs, you have to make a list of the things that you need, and the costs are going to be very specific to your social business. So we are going to make the example of Babele, but the Babele is an online platform, so it can depend. But there are some main categories that you can think about. So what's the rent that you're going to pay? What are the utilities? What is the equipment? Uh, if you are producing something, then you maybe need some raw materials. Uh, you need licenses and intellectual property stuff. <laughs> For us, uh, website servers, these were important costs. Marketing, this you have in any case. Insurance, lawyers. So the most important thing is to uh, think about these categories uh, to make sure you don't forget one when you make your uh, financial uh, forecasting and cost forecasting. And you have to think about two main categories. So one is the fixed costs, the one that you need to uh, cover anyhow, and they are, they are not going to depend that much on uh, how much you are going to sell. 
So it can be rent, okay, if you increase incredibly uh, and you have many more employees, rent is going to uh, increase as well, but at the very beginning, this is going to be a fixed cost. Um, and then you have variable costs, and these are costs that depend on how much you're going to sell, especially, for example, for products, and we have the category raw material, this is typically a variable cost, or for example, um, um, yeah, utilities, um, uh, if you are going to use a lot of electricity in order to produce uh, things or equipment at a certain point, if you're going to need more. What's very important in all these, okay, you have the categories, but you have to uh, have, as Man was uh, uh, talking in his uh, workshop on lean startup, you have to think how to reduce these costs, how to trim them back, how to um, maybe buy some stuff that are already used or uh, see how you can reduce as much as possible these costs. And usually when you're doing uh, forecasting, uh, you're going to do some um, uh, forecasting of costs and you're going to try to reduce them as much. And usually what happens is that we are always uh, much too positive on how much revenue we are going to make. And uh, um, as well as how we are underestimating the costs. And it's funny, what I wanted to share with you next is like the example of uh, Babele and our online platform. And this example is um, uh, forecasting on uh, financial modeling that we did three years ago. And we can show how positive we were on uh, re uh, regarding our um, let's say, um, forecasting. forecasting also for revenues and for the costs. Uh, I'm going to put it maybe full screen or... No, that's fine. That's fine. So one of the basic things is to put these categories that we were talking about um, in some lines, like personnel costs, IT costs, because we are a web platform, we have a lot of IT costs. Marketing, this is a, a traditional category. Uh, maybe some other stuff if they are small. So put the categories that you thought about when you identified them here, and then try to be as specific as possible and also put them month by month. So we had for our cases, sorry, I'm, <laughs> I'm moving around. Um, our personal costs were very important and we, we were trying to forecast how many back-end developers we are going to need, how many front-end developers we are going to need, how many designers, community managers. Very important when you forecast the personal costs to think also about the labor uh, taxes because this is something that people uh, especially at the startup le uh, level forget and you're thinking about the net uh, salary and not putting the labor costs which can be significant in Romania they are over 70 percent so I have to pay 170 percent compared to what the net salary is our second big category was the IT, so uh, maintenance, uh, certificates, server, hardware, and other stuff. And the idea is really to try to think month by month what these costs are going to be. So it's nothing, um, uh, let's say, um, super uh, hard. The hardest is actually to think all the possible costs that you could have and not uh, oversee one of them. So for us, for example, regarding marketing, marketing can be very different from one company to another. For us, marketing meant being present at conferences where we were talking about Babele, where we had stands and we were paying for the tickets at these conferences or professional, uh, promotional material, leaflets, roll-ups, visit cards, uh, or uh, the promotion on Google AdWords or Facebook ads, or uh, doing a promotional video. So it really depends on your categories. This is why it's very hard to do actually 
um, um, webinar on financial forecasting without knowing the specific cases of your business. Um, what's uh, um, very important, so I have put at the very end the overhead head costs, so these were like um, the fixed costs for us, accounting, legal consulting, the rent for the office, and then I made the total. And um, I made this uh, forecasting for an application for funds, so uh, it was their template and uh, Strange enough, they had the revenues at the end. Usually, and one is going to show that it is when we have uh, cash flow statements. Usually, you have the revenue, the gross profit. You take out the value of the goods sold, and then you have your net revenue, and then the whole list of the cost. But uh, yeah, anyhow, the profit, the um, 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 Profit is usually revenue less costs, and then we are going to enter into more details when we go with Manu to show the different profit margins types, uh, operating profit, uh, net profit, and um, enter more into details for this. Wonderful. So we get back to the presentation. And um, so after the forecast, uh, so to start with the basics regarding the financial statements, uh, we want to present to you a finance pyramid that was presented by Bill Reichardt in The Art of Startup Finance, which is uh, one of the best YouTube series that you can find on uh, uh, how startups should manage, the, manage their finance and was made by the Kaufman Foundation. And, uh, uh, as you can see, at the very base of the pyramid, there is the foundation of your business. And the foundation of your business is reflected with your balance sheet. Um, above that, you see processes, and these are the processes of your business, and these are reflected in the income statement and your cash flow statement. And uh, uh, we're going to be focusing on these three tools. Above that, there are also other tools that you can actually check in uh, The Art of Startup by Bill Reichardt, uh, which are business model, operating budget, and then building a management dashboard. And uh, these tools like, are really important because they help you uh, understanding what is happening in the, co in the company, what has happened in the past, and what you can expect it will happen in the future. And uh, um, if you like watched uh, the Lean Startup uh, um, uh, webinar and you saw the statistics of how many startup and social enterprises they actually failed, then you know that you, the whole world of entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship is really filled with uncertainty. So uh, things are changing rapidly all the time, so you really need to have those tools uh, uh, in order to manage this uncertainty and make sure that you can find uh, uh, the right uh, iteration for your social business. Well, so the foundation of your financial structure so is the balance sheet. And uh, the, balance sheet, the balance sheet is nothing else than uh, a picture of uh, the financial condition of your company at any given time. And uh, uh, the balance sheet is split in two, as you can see in the slide. So on the one hand, you've got the assets, and on the other hand, you've got the liabilities and the, and the shareholders equity. And uh, um, your asset begin at the top with cash, which is probably the most important asset that you got. Then you got the so-called account receivable, which is nothing else than the money that you expect to be paid by your customers. And uh, in some cases, you can have inventory, for example, products that uh, you haven't sold yet and that you still have in stock. And uh, those together, they are your current asset. Then you also have long-term asset, and this may include uh, uh, improvements, for example, uh, on your office or your building. You can have equipment. For example, to build your product or service, uh, uh, the car, etc., and then you can you can have property. You can have uh, you can you can possess actual property. You can possess an office. You can possess a factory, and uh, put it all together. These are the assets of your company. So on the other side of the balance sheet, 
um, you can actually find your liabilities and the shareholders' equity. And uh, as for your liabilities, these include uh, things like that. So, for example, payables. This is the money that you owe to other people. And uh, um, then you have accrued liabilities. And this is the money that you owe, owe to people like your employees. And uh, your payable and your accrued liabilities are considered your short-term liabilities. And that's really important because you want to know what kind of things you need to pay sooner rather than later. And uh, when you look at things that you would actually have to pay later, then uh, you look, for example, at your long-term debt, which is the money that you borrowed and uh, that you need to pay off, but not immediately. And uh, put it all together, this uh, makes your total liability. Um, The, I would say that the most important part of the balance sheet and these, uh, uh, these two facets uh, of the same uh, of the balance sheet is that uh, the assets, they always equal, equal the, the liability and the stakeholder and the shareholders equity. So when you build your balance sheet and you do not get the same number on the left and on the right, then it means that you actually have a mistake somewhere. So check with your bookkeeper if the assets are not the same as the liabilities and uh, shareholders' equity, then there's something very wrong there. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, then you need to ask yourself, when a banker, for example, looks at your balance sheet, what are these guys going to look at exactly? So the first thing that they look at is definitely the cash because they want to know if you have enough cash to keep going. And then they're going to be looking at something else, which is called the working capital. And the working capital, it includes everything that you can convert into cash into a relatively, in, in, a, in a short amount of time. Um, so you take into account not only the cash, but you also take into account uh, the account uh, receivable uh, that you hopefully you're going to convert into cash pretty soon. And this together is called the working capital. Then, beyond the working capital, the banker is also uh, like might want to subtract uh, the short-term liabilities, and then you obtain the net working capital. And uh, this, like this net working capital, so the working capital minus your short-term liabilities, is actually what to, what you want to focus on uh, to keep the company going. And. Um, uh, another thing that bankers might actually also look is the ratio between your debt and your equity. And uh, as you can imagine, um, they want to know that uh, you have plenty of equity and you have uh, a little amount of debt in comparison. And uh, in, to improve the performance of your company, if you improve the per performance of your company, then you will naturally improve your debt to equity ratio. This means that uh, uh, to increase your equity, you must make more profit uh, and so add to your retained earnings. Um, then another thing is, uh, there you go, the two strategies. So um, the other thing is also uh, that in case in some investors can also ask you at some point uh, that some of the people that borrowed you money co to convert their debt into equity because uh, this is also a way to reduce your debt and to increase your equity and make uh, your company more appealing. So you hear maybe about convertible shareholder loan. That's what it means, actually. So sometimes you have your shareholders that don't put the money directly in equity. They put it as a loan towards the company, but it's convertible so that these loans become equity afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this makes a lot of sense when your company is really difficult to um, evaluate. And so it's really difficult to estimate how much is the value of the company. So a person might find it less risky to give you that first and then eventually like uh, transform that, that into equity in case the company really uh, becomes uh, attractive and uh, financially attractive. Okay, and uh, um, 
when you want to, and then when you also, of course, when you talk to investors, you know, the important thing is that you want to be able to produce the latest, the most current balance sheet. Uh, and so you should produce a balance sheet at the end of each month. And so theoretically right now you should have uh, uh, on your hands the balance sheet from last month. Yeah, if you have your company already uh, incorporated. Correct. <laughs> okay. Then, um, after the foundation, then we continue with the processes, with the financial processes, and uh, um, uh, the financial processes, as we said before, they encompass uh, uh, the income statement and the cash flow statement. And uh, as you can see in this image, um, uh, the, income, the income statement and the cash flow st statement, they sit right on top of your, uh, of your balance sheet. So on top of the uh, financial foundation of your company. And uh, the balance sheet is a static uh, snapshot of your company health at any given point in time, while uh, your income statement and your cash flow statement, uh, they show your financial processes. Uh, and that's like a video of your business over, over a period of time. Yeah, so the balance sheet is a photo, the income statement and the cash flow statements are like a video. So and some other people make comparisons with the bath uh, where you're filling uh, uh, water into uh, I don't know, a, bath tube. a bath tube and then uh, the balance sheet is uh, looking at the level of the water and uh, then uh, the cash flow statements is what exactly what the water is pouring in and pouring out and how it is distributed and um, if you want to see like uh, the different roles uh, of these uh, uh, three different uh, financial um, um, processes then uh, the balance sheet uh, simply measures the current state of the company so the assets the liabilities the owner's equity while the income statement uh, um, it shows uh, how profitable the company is, like does it make money, does it lose money, while the cash flow statement, uh, it shows how much money came in and went out uh, and how, what the cash was used for. These are the three main uh, uh, short explanation about uh, these three processes. So uh, let's talk about the income statement. So at the top of your income statement, as I was saying and explaining in your example, usually uh, in the example I was showing with Pabele, usually they come the revenues. And uh, then out of that, you, has, you have the cost of goods sold, which is usually a fixed uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, variable cost. So this is why you put it actually really depending on the revenues. And once you have uh, these two and you extract the uh, cost of goods sold less the revenue, uh, this is what your um, 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 gross. Uh, this is what your gross profit is. So um, yeah. I would say it's just like that. And then um, when you look at the margin, very important is that you put the gross profit divided by the revenues. So uh, sometimes, for example, in an, uh, in an example where you have a product that costs $100 and the cost of the goods sold costs $50, then you have your gross profit $50. But this doesn't mean that uh, you have 100% margin because you sell at 100. No, you have 50% margin. So that's very important in order to understand. And usually investors, they love it when you have a big uh, gross profit margin. And um, that's something that you're going to be asked, uh, what's your gross profit margin? And um, of course, you know, the higher the gross profit margin, uh, the better. And um, because then it means that your business has the potential to be really profitable. So once you have your gross profit margin, uh, then you extract the cost of, of other stuff like the revenue, um, the research and development, engineering, marketing, sales, uh, administrative costs. So these are other operating expenses. 
So once you extract these other operating expenses, you have the operating profit or the famous EBITDA. So earnings before interest, uh, tax, depreciation and amortization. And uh, how do you calculate then the operating profit margin? You take this EBITDA and you divide it by the revenues at the very beginning. And you multiply it by 100. And, to get the percentage. Uh, of course. And uh, so if we take away also these interests, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, that uh, is the EBITDA of EBITDA, then that's how we actually ca uh, calculate uh, the net income. And of course, you know, like also in this case, you can actually uh, you can actually calculate the, the net income margin, which is uh, one of the other indicators that uh, uh, investors or impact investors can potentially ask you about your financials. And net income margin is always net income divided by the revenues and multiplied by 100. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so the question becomes also what investors want to know when it comes uh, 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 when it when it comes to this information. So they're really investors, of course, are really interested in your margins. Uh, so of course, they're going to be asking about your gross margin, your operating profit margin, and your net margin. And uh, uh, of course, you know they're going to be looking at these indicators uh, to see how profitable you are and how efficiently you're actually running your company. And, uh, but beyond this, you know, there are also other things that they can look at, which are called uh, um, operational efficiencies. And uh, the question is, uh, how efficient are you running these processes compared to other companies? And so like what investors usually do is that they look at certain ratios, for example, how much you're spending on marketing compared to your revenues, or how much do you spend on sales compared to revenues? And uh, then they're going to be looking at how these ratios they compared to other companies in your sector or other companies in their portfolio. So um, if you're going to be looking at some point to raise money from an impact investor, you also want to learn uh, to look at these ratios and get uh, those ratios in line with the, with the expectation of these impact investors. And uh, even if you're not looking for um, for funding or uh, to raise money, uh, these can also that can anyway help you to be more efficient and to relate yourself to our other companies that are doing something within the same uh, uh, sector. So let's look at the third uh, um, statement, which is the cash flow statement. Uh, and the cash flow statement starts actually with what uh, we uh, talked about, the net income. Uh, so it's the last uh, line <laughs> uh, from uh, the income statement. And then you look at uh, stuff that didn't uh, have an influence on uh, your um, uh, account. So the uh, um, changes in account receivable. Uh, here it's very important to have a look. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Because, sorry, know, Wani wants to intervene. Uh, no. He doesn't like what I'm saying. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. But you know, like uh, the, the main idea is that we mentioned the accounts receivable uh, earlier, and uh, sometimes, uh, like, we can set a product for a customer, but. Uh, um, the customers actually they might not give you the cash immediately, but may pay you after 30, say 60 or 90 days. And uh, so it means that uh, this the number of this money that uh, like you are supposed to receive, it's uh, a deferred payment. So you don't receive it immediately. And so that's the reason why like it's important to look at this account receivable. Um, and you have to uh, take it out from the net income because you have it added in your um, uh, revenues, but you don't have it as cash actually in your uh, accounts. So uh, this is uh, maybe one of the difference between what you have on your bookkeeping and what you have really uh, in your bank accounts. And this is why you take uh, the difference out. 
So it's the same thing for the accounts payable because uh, it might ha might happen that you receive an invoice but you pay it after 19 days, uh, so you don't pay it straight away. Yeah. So when you have the net income less the changes in these accounts receivable and accounts payable, you have the cash flow from uh, operations or um, OPEX. And um, then what you have to extract is also your capital expenditure. Maybe you have heard about it, CapEx. You know, fi financial people really like to talk in uh, jargon, so CapEx, OPEX, and all that stuff. So you will take out all that, everything that you have uh, paid uh, for your equipment, furniture, and uh, um, investments, actually things that will be seen afterwards in the balance sheet. And then you take out uh, all the uh, money that has been paid for uh, financing activities or that you have received. So this is why we write here change in debt and change in equity. So it can be plus or minus, it depends what happened. If you, uh, had, uh, if you had to pay your debt back or if you have received more equity from investors it really depends so like it's uh, if you raise debt or you raise equity this is increasing your cash while if you pay your debt or if you buy back your equity you're simply reducing your cash so finally we, the cash that is in your accounts is the um, cash flow from operation minus the capex plus minus the financing activities Yes. Yay! So we have the three explained. Now what happens? Yeah, so the beautiful thing of uh, these three statements is that uh, you can really see the big picture uh, and how they all relate together one to the other. So this is all we have seen and uh, uh, if you, you look at the revenues at the top of the income statement and you can flow down through the expenses uh, to your net income, which is at the bottom of your income statement, and it goes at the top of your cash flow statement. And uh, this flows uh, uh, like uh, to uh, the net cash that you actually have uh, uh, in your pockets. And uh, the net cash, if you click one more time. You find it in your balance sheet. Exactly. So you can see that uh, these three statements, uh, so your balance sheet, your income state statement, and your cash flow statement, uh, they are all tied together beautifully in the end. So the final thing that we wanted to talk with you about is the break-even point. Uh, this is something very important that many people talk about it. Have you already reached break-even? famous break-even. So it's um, very important, the total cost less the total uh, revenues and you reach the break-even when these equal. And at the very beginning you will have costs that are going to be higher than your revenues and uh, hopefully at the end you're going to have some profits so your revenues are going to be higher than your uh, costs. So the break-even is the point where the two intersect. And um, very important, and I saw this in another uh, webinar and I really liked it, you can have different break-even points. It really depends on you. So you can reach, for example, break-even because you don't count your own salary. So it's as if you would make self-voluntarism for your social business and you're just covering uh, your total costs uh, through the revenues but without paying yourself. Then you can have a break even with salary, so where you are paying yourself. Uh, this is the case right now with Babele. <laughs> so we are at our second break even point. And then uh, hopefully in the future we will reach our third break even point, which is paying yourself with a good salary. Yeah. So this is more or less what I wanted to say, I think. Do you want to add something more, Manu? What, uh, what I really recommend is to have a look at the, the Art of Startup Finance, uh, this uh, YouTube uh, um, series. 
uh, of the Kaufman Foundation. I think we are going to add the link in uh, the Babede overview so that you can have a direct look at it, so you can go more into details. And um, if Manu doesn't want to add anything else, what I would do is that I would do like questions and answers for the people that are participating at the webinar. Yeah. But I'm not able to see um, how many people have joined. Um, I think we maybe lost our live participants, so I think it might just be me. Um, but I do have a question. Um, so yeah. this is a really fantastic presentation, and you gave us a lot of uh, you know resources to think about about doing financial modeling, and you showed us an example of um, an Excel sheet that you were using, which I think is a really great tool because almost everybody has Excel. Um, I'm wondering if there are other softwares that you are that you would recommend as being helpful with financial modeling, um, and or you know maybe at what point in your business might it be worth investing in something that's more sophisticated than Excel, or do you think that's sufficient for sort of the lifetime of your business? Um, a software question. Uh, for the lifetime of your business, no, uh, but uh, it still can do a lot of stuff. So the one that I have showed is uh, just a very simple one. Uh, so these were projections that we were doing uh, more than three years ago. <laughs> In the meantime, they are more complex. But you can do a lot of stuff with Excel, and um, I don't think uh, what's important is to have a good uh, uh, relationship with your bookkeeper because maybe you can uh, we uh, you are doing uh, some projections but it's not related with uh, what your real business is and to have a real uh, connection there and uh, understand what uh, he's saying and um, I think that's more important than software mm -hmm. that's my answer <laughs> you know, and you can do a lot of stuff with Excel, but understanding the main concepts like uh, accounts receivable, accounts payable, uh, networking capital, uh, capex, and all that stuff, that's more important than software. Yeah, absolutely, and that's uh, ultimately what an investor is going to look at, you know, which is, uh, as we said at the very beginning, that you're not just the product guy or the imaginary uh, innovator, but you're also capable to understand exactly uh, what's an income statement, uh, uh, the revenues, uh, the cost, the expenses, and so on, and that you're really capable of understanding these pieces of information that, that not only the accountant uh, or the bookkeeper is supposed to be managing. Great. And do you guys have yeah. Startup actually that is working on these uh, uh, softwares right now. <laughs> yeah, we're collaborating with a friend of ours which is working uh, on uh, a software for these uh, uh, financial indicators. So uh, the, the software is not yet launched, but uh, uh, we will definitely make it available to the community as soon as that's uh, online. Nice. Um... Going off of that answer to my question then too, I guess my second follow-up question is, how can you tell when, I guess, you know, there are a lot of resources in this lecture and you mentioned some other websites and I think there are a lot of online tools where you can use to teach yourself some of this revenue modeling and bookkeeping. Um, and if you're sort of a young startup, maybe that's sufficient. Um, how do you tell when you think it's time to bring on a more professional bookkeeper? Um, or maybe that's at the very beginning, if you feel like you're out of your depth. Um, you know, how do you sort of figure out when you've crossed a line between maybe being able to do this yourself and needing somebody who um, has more training? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so, frankly, from our own experience, uh, we both started in a business school, so we start with them before becoming entrepreneurs. <laughs> so, in our personal case, we, we didn't uh, need to uh, make, you know, the switch. Uh, but uh, what I can see at other fellow entrepreneurs is that, uh, indeed, there is a time when they uh, grow a lot and they are not managing these 
concepts and they might uh, make big errors. Yeah, and probably you know like the biggest problem is not uh, is also the fact that uh, uh, at some point uh, uh, the most complicated part is keeping those books in order. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the reason why at some point you're always going to have uh, because we had, for example, an accountant since the very beginning, right? Yeah, but that's the Romanian law. I think in the US is different. In the US, you can do a lot of stuff on your own without the bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in our case, like we were supposed to have an accountant since the very beginning, mm -hmm. but uh, if at some point, uh, like you feel, really feel that you want to focus on the uh, on really managing the business rather than uh, just uh, keeping uh, the books in order, then you simply need to have uh, a great office manager that is going to help you to keep all this information, and then it's going to allow you to like look at the big picture without having to worry to just do all these uh, bookkeeping on your own. Great. Um, well, I think that answers my questions, um, which I think brings us to the end of our time. If you guys have any closing thoughts or final things you want to leave us with. Yeah, so what we are going to do is, uh, I really hope this is going to be interactive. So if people have specific questions regarding financial modeling for their own business, we are going to be uh, this week, like the, the, the following, the, the week that comes in the next week, super available to discuss these points mm -hmm. and um, yeah, for specific questions. And I, I really think um, it's a tricky webinar because it really depends on your own situation, <laughs> especially at the very beginning when you when people are doing projections for their costs. So yeah more yeah i think it's i think it's definitely challenging because it is so variable from business to business and also um you know relative to some of the topics that we've covered i think this is one of the more um technical um sort of skills based uh lectures that we've done um you know it's very practical it's very hands-on as opposed to some of the more theoretical conversations we've had so I'll just encourage people to log into the platform and be vocal with their questions uh, if they're having challenges completing their homeworks. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.